Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Indie Show. I'm your host, Joey Vitelli. This is a, a live talk show for and with creatives. I'm super excited today to be with Emily kerr -Fennell. Did I say that right, Emily? Perfect. Awesome. So Emily is from Wholesale in a Box. And I, I know there are a lot of handmakers, uh, artists, designers in uh, in my Facebook group that follow indie law in general. And Emily, when we got connected, I knew that I wanted to interview you because you're doing something that's so cool. Can you talk to us a little bit about Wholesale in a Box and kind of the story behind the business? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. It's really fun. Um, Wholesale in a Box, so it came out of, we started it about three years ago. And it came out of my partner and I having worked with um, artists and makers and designers for a long time, like a decade and a half. And then in the last few years before that, we started hearing the same thing over and over again, which was like, I love what I do. I've gotten a great response, you know, at craft markets or on Etsy or whatever it is. But for this to be sustainable for me financially, but also in terms of people's energy in life, yep. I need to be in more stores. Mm. But that can be really hard because on the one hand, you have the trade show route, which usually costs about $20,000 a pop and is a big gamble, especially these days. You might get some orders or you might not. Or if people are trying to manage their own direct outreach to stores, it's, you know, it's hard to find stores that are going to be a good fit. It's hard to manage that outreach process. It's like, do I follow up? What do I say when I follow up? What did the store say? Do I need a line sheet? All of that. So we created Wholesale in a Box pretty organically in response to those challenges. Mm. Um, and we basically what we did was we just went back to those same people that we had those conversations with. And we were like, you know, I think we can use our experience and our passion for helping creative people do what they love. Um, how's this? Like we built something and we were like, would this be helpful to you? And that first response that we got was so positive that we just built from there. And then over the last three years have built it into what it is today. And we've helped 400 makers now grow their wholesale business, which is so cool. That's, a, that's a lot. It's a lot. And, um, you know, and it, it's 400 is 400, but yeah. when you hear the individual stories, right. like people that were able to, you know, quit their day job or hire their husband on full time and you know, they're in stores like that they really love and respect. It's really satisfying. Um, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, b before we, we go too much further, can you give us a sense of just kind of like the range of services that fall? Yeah, in what it is. Box? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's it's actually really simple, and there's not that much of a range of services. Okay. There's like one thing we do, and we try to do it really well. Awesome. I love um, it. So it's a subscription service. You pay by the month, like Netflix. But um, instead of Netflix, what you get is um, three things. So the first thing is 20 hand-picked store leads. Um, so this is not like a computer algorithm. This is us sitting down and saying, OK, what would be the best 20 stores for Caitlin to reach out to this month based on her goals and her aesthetic and how she wants to grow? Um, and then each of those stores has a full visual profile with the buyer name and other brands that sell there and, you know, other information about the store. And then we take those and put them into um, like an online outreach management system that's preset with all the outreach that they'll need to do for the store. And they can it'll automatically like if the store says no, it'll automatically change up what they need to do. Store says yes, et cetera. And then the third thing, and this is the part that people love, is um, wholesale coaching and support. So we, they're part of this full wholesale basics course, um, and we do phone and email coaching unlimited as much as they want throughout the subscription one-on-one -on -one. because we've just found there is just no replacement for it. Uh, I, I love it. So in yeah. order for you guys to provide that level of service, and I mean, 400 is, a, is an awesome number, are yeah. you intentionally uh, – keeping things limited so right because it's can, not four yeah. million right yeah i mean to a certain extent um no i would imagine so to give that level and degree of service and, yeah and side note direction for a minute that's a lot of tech <laughs> yeah it is so 
it, it was that something that you guys like put a lot of time into and you feel like you kind of built this perfect system and then clients came and it worked or has this been an ongoing battle to get a technology kind of at a place where it's best serving your clients? Yeah. Um, it has been an ongoing, I'm trying to do like a flip word for battle, an ongoing mm. dance. <laughs> Let's make it positive. Yeah. An ongoing. It's, it's totally ongoing. It was really incremental when we started. We did not have a whole app or system. It was yeah. much more, um, ad hoc um, yes. and then we develop yeah. I, but which I would recommend to people I think sometimes when people are starting businesses they do a lot of infrastructure um, yeah. and then hope people you know now I've invested fifty thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars or five thousand dollars and hope people come in the door um, so we didn't do it that way but it has meant that you know as we get a little more money we invest it in the system yeah. as we get a little more money we invest it in better training so we're constantly improving it and working. No, out. that's that's awesome. And I I ask that because kind of business owner to business owner, both you and I and anybody yeah. who's watching, I I learned that lesson the hard way. And I know a lot of other business owners have because it can be so tempting, so especially tempting. if if you define yourself as a creative or an artist. I think that you are kind of drawn to this perfectionist oh, way oh. of a business having to be made so that you're proud of it. Yeah, and not and being okay for it just to be workable in the beginning yeah can can really be super powerful yeah um so so all right let's say that you know some of the, one of the first things that you do is you do like this hand-picked selection of uh stores that they can work with yeah um, how did you go about building relationships with these kinds of stores so that you can you know make these types of connections happen that's a really good question so one thing that's a little different about us is that we're not a rep and we're not a marketplace. So we're not actually the go-between between the maker and the store. Okay. Uh, so we probably have about 6,000 stores in our portfolio and we don't have individual relationships with each and every one of those stores. Okay. Um, we're kind of like the maker's secret weapon and store scout on their side of things. Um, we're recommending the store and passing along really detailed information, and then they forge the relationship with that store. Gotcha. Um, and the relationship is between them, which is good too, because we don't have any like commission or percentage. Yeah, oh, and that, yeah, that makes it seem like what's well, such a more genuine push yeah. in that direction. Right. Yeah. The oh, I, one thing is that that was not true at the beginning, but now mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of information about the stores mm -hmm. that a regular maker wouldn't have, right? Like sure. what was, you know, Amanda buying a year and a half ago and what was she buying six months ago? And what 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 was the maker's experience that bought from that she bought from a year and a half ago? Yeah. So we're able to pull that information in when we're picking out stores. Um, That's so interesting. And that just reminds me, you know, I, I'm definitely not a hand maker, but one of the uh, one of the uh, pain points that I hear a lot from kind of listening to people on Facebook is, yeah. especially if you're not in this wholesale environment, there's a lot of pressure to turn your customers into repeat customers mm -hmm. and how that is such a kind of highly dependent part of making your business run. Um, yeah. if, if you go into the wholesale direction, I guess there's, there's less of that, but are, are the wholesale, the businesses that would wholesale you, are they also taking that into account? Like the, if we take this item from you, people will come back to, to purchase other items that we would have in our stores. From the store owner's perspective. Yeah. I mean, from the store owner's perspective, they, yeah, I mean, it's so hard being a store owner. They have to think about, um, you know, they're putting out when they're buying wholesale, it's not consignment. They, they have to like pony up right thousands of dollars to take a risk on a maker. And that product yeah, has to perform um, because it, and by perform, it has to sell. It has to bring people into the store. It has to bring them back the next time. It has to do a lot of things. Um, so I think they're definitely like when the maker, we try to really advise our makers to put themselves in the store owner's shoes. Like, you know, ultimately they're passionate people, but they're, they also need to think through those like hard nosed yeah. aspects for yeah. sure when they're thinking about what to buy. So I, I love it. it. Is it your experience? Do 
your typical clients or customers, um, do they tend to uh, kind of say yes to wholesale in a box and start the subscription um, after they have had some experience with trying to sell wholesale? Mm -hmm. um, or is it something where once people have this idea and they're like, oh, that sounds like an awesome idea, um, can they kind of jump right in bed with you guys? It's a mix. Okay. Um, it So usually people have already tried a bit um, yeah. and gotten into a few stores and realized that it's time consuming and can be frustrating. And they've yeah. realized like, oh, this is the direction I want to invest in. Um, on the other hand, sometimes people are brand new and they're really excited about the training and guidance and coaching that they'll get. So they actually want to sign up before they've gotten into any stores. Yeah. So it can be anywhere in there. I think that um, what I do advise people is that they don't sign up with us when they are just at like a concept stage or when they don't have some amount of sales and interfacing with people under their belt. Like if people have never been to a craft market, not sold on Etsy, not done any trunk shows and they wanna jump right to selling to stores, it can be really hard to know whether you have your pricing where it needs to be, whether your product is where it needs to be. So, yeah. no, yeah. that's a really good good call. And I feel like probably most of your clients would, if they're selling wholesale, they're probably not only selling wholesale. Right. Right. Yep. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I I know that having having your own online store and trying to direct traffic to it can be can be really difficult. Um, right. What. And again, just trying to get a sense of anybody who's watching live or the recording. Um, when when you do hear that, you know, somebody's interested in working with you, um, what are some things that you get out of that first conversation or first form that they fill out that really excites you about, you know, this is, I think, is going to be a really awesome fit moving forward? Mm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because we get on the phone with a lot of people, like people from our website, you can set a call with us just to explore whether it would be a good fit. And so we yeah. learn a lot in those initial conversations. Um, I mean, it's the same things that I would tell someone, um, I do wholesale workshops. Um, and so just generally, when people ask, like, how do I know if I'm ready for wholesale? I think it's really those same things. It's like, do I have a good product that can compete nationwide, um, which is very subjective and hard to sometimes hard to assess on your own. But because um, you have to think you're moving just the makers that are local to you, you're now competing with, you know, if you're soap, every soap maker in the country, right? Yeah. Um, so the uniqueness and quality of the product, um, I would say that experience in, in getting feedback from the market Yep. Um, some type of online representation of your work. It doesn't have to be an official line sheet, an official catalog, but okay. some place that store owners can go to that represents your brand well, um, yep. and they can look at it. And then, so usually, usually when I'm really excited about a maker, it's because of their line. It's because it's cohesive and they're passionate about it and they have a, a, they're able to tell the story of what they're, you know, what it looks like to make yeah. the product. And it's just not something you see every single day. And, you know, usually those are the people that do the best. Okay. I love that. And now I think that we can dip a little bit into the legal side of things because, uh, yeah. because I think that yeah, a probably. lot of people are like, oh, I have this really great idea or this really great product. Right. And I'm interested in wholesaling or not, but how can I protect this thing and make sure that to whatever extent right. I can, the competition can't completely rip it off. And right. Well, let me even go further because yeah. I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. Cause then people say, well, I don't want to share it with stores. I don't want to send them my catalog. I don't want to promote it because I'm worried someone's going to take it. So what do you say? What do you say? to that? I, I would say, there's a very similar argument that's made for anybody who's watching that's not a handmaker kind of in the startup world where they're like, oh, I I really want to talk with an investor or someone who might loan me money, but I want to make them sign an NDA before I talk to them any about anything. And the reality is it, there's a very, very, very small chance that people that you're talking to about your business that are in that type of a relationship are interested in stealing your idea. 
And usually if you ask for an NDA or you are sh sh kind of sheltering the idea when you're talking to them about that, um, they might not laugh out loud, but they won't really take you as seriously has been my mm -hmm. experience. Um, but I, on the other hand, I do think that there are, um, there are certain types of businesses that by their very nature kind of do deserve that type of protection. Mm -hmm. So I know that we talked really, really briefly in a previous call about the Typeset Co, which is a business that I've worked with yeah. in the past. And they, yeah. their whole product was, is kind of like the revival of those magnetic letters. And so, I mean, it's much more than that. They put a lot of time into what those, the fonts, what they look like. It's a beautiful product, but, yeah, it's awesome. but they didn't want the, they didn't want their idea of, Hey, we're going to kind of just redo this old thing and do it in a different way. They didn't want that to kind of be an idea that would float out there. So I get that in certain ex extents and also yeah. like they're, the people behind that company are also like branding experts. They have businesses behind them. So yeah. they're more well-versed in kind of understanding if and when an idea should be protected. But a yeah. lot of what I'm seeing, and I don't know how much of these you work with, but there's so much handmade items out there that are phrase or word based yeah. where the, the actual like unique value that they're selling is, not the quality of the shirt or the mug, but it's mm -hmm. what they think is like a cute phrase mm -hmm. that they put on the item. And I don't know how, how much you work with those businesses that have like phrase based items. Yeah. But that is from a legal perspective, a nightmare of a business. Right. Because there's those phrases don't really qualify as trademarks. Right. But there are people who are claiming trademark rights for them. And it's, there's really not a way of preventing other people from having another shirt with that same phrase stylized <laughs> a little bit differently, or even in some cases, the exact same way. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd be curious to hear kind of your response to that. But as a lawyer, when I see that, I'm like, mm, it's cool that you can do this. And if you have a strong enough brand to where anybody who copies you can't really compete because you've got 400,000 followers on Instagram. Right. Cool. But if you're not in that space, then you really need to understand the risk of people can rip you off and there's not much you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, even with a really unique product, in a lot of cases, there's not that much you can do. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, you could tell us more about this, but in a lot of cases, um, unless the uniqueness is very concrete, right. it's not just like an aesthetic or an approach or a perspective. Um, it can be hard to defend, but the phrase, the phrase thing in particular can be really tough and is hard to wholesale. It's, it's interesting because there's a lot of overlap, right? Like if anybody can do it, yep. it's not very defendable. And if anybody can do it, it's not that wholesaleable either. Yeah. Well, and it's a comp, it's a combination, I think of, um, people getting into the business by starting as like a side hobby. Sure. And also technology is just so crazy right now where anybody, if they see a cool idea, can take that design and put it on a mug. Right. Or a shirt. Right. And so the ability for copycats to really easily create knockoffs is, is something that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, in, in terms of the law, what I, what I try and tell people especially if they hop on like a console call with me is that there's a, there's a difference between what your rights actually are, right? What apparent rights you can kind of throw around. Uh -huh. and so there, there's a, a, a number of things that you can do to kind of threaten and see if they call your bluff and kind of play good cop before you play bad cop and see if they're cooperative. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're unwilling to change, then, forcing them to change or forcing them to pay you a penalty can get sticky. Like that's where like, if you don't have registration protections behind certain things, there's not much you can do after you send a cease and desist letter. Yeah. And that's in some ways that's helpful, but it's, it's one of those two edged swords where people who understand that limitation 
can, you know, just completely ignore cease and desist letters that they receive if there's mm -hmm. no source of a registration. Or what's happening on Etsy is people are sending, people are seeing people copying their phrases on items and they're sending DMCA takedown notices through the Etsy platform mm. when actually there's no trademark or copyright infringement going on. Right. Right. But the way that Etsy works is if you hit like three or more of those reports, then your story just gets shut down. Right. And so a lot of businesses who aren't actually doing anything wrong, even if they are pulling inspiration from other sources, are getting dinged without cause. Yeah. And they're, and they're one strike away from their entire income stream on Etsy being taken away. Well, and that's why you talk about diversifying yep. off of Etsy, right? Yep. That's one of the potential pitfalls of having your whole business yeah. on a platform like that, right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, and I think that to some extent there there's a mindset of I think hand makers and crafters and designers who think, you know, I'm I'm in this, but it's mostly a side hobby that makes some income and that's okay. Yeah. Um do you do you feel like you, you work with any clients or customers who haven't yet made that step into this is actually a self-sustaining business that I one day want to, you know, pay me what I'm worth? Some um, people generally approach for many people. It's been an evolution, you sure. know, from yep. a hot side thing to a bigger thing. And yep. so we catch people at all different stages in that. Um, some people do for sure come to us and they have a, they have a full-time job and they're growing their business, um, you know, trying to get wholesale going before they make the leap to switching over. Got it. Got it. And, and what in your, like in your, uh, experience, what have been some kind of peripheral services to yours? So like, like one of, one of the big things that I try and do, and this show is kind of an example of it is. Yeah. You know, whether or not people are ready for a lawyer, if they think that they want legal help, there's probably other service providers out there, like people that can help you with wholesale. Um, if and when people are kind of thinking about wholesale and, and using wholesale in a box to help them, um, what are some other types of service providers that might be a really good fit for them if they haven't yet explored that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... It depends. There are a lot of different um, strengths and weaknesses that a business can have, and everybody has a different set. Yeah. I think um, Aolidia, who you also know, yes. Ariana Aolidia, not every where they want to do this, but if a maker is at the stage where they really need help with their website and their branding, um, something she could be a great asset. Also, she's really good about talking to people and being honest about saying, like, you know, maybe the timing isn't quite right, but we're here when you're ready or something like that. Um, so there's that whole piece of things, branding. Um, I think we can be complementary with other platforms. So a lot of our yeah. makers are on Etsy Wholesale or they're on IndieMe or another wholesale platform. And they so that's kind of like the more passive component of what they do for wholesale. And then they work with us so that there's a piece of it that's active and that is in their hands and that they can count on. Yep. Um, and then of course, I mean, there's just, like you alluded to before, like most people don't just do wholesale. They also do some amount of craft markets. They also do, you know, Etsy, just regular Etsy. Um, sell on their own website and so I think that and I, you know I think that's a really positive strategy because the things feed off of each other and there's like a yep. bit of synergy among those chance it's almost hard as a business owner because you want to focus and focus is so important but at the same time no you're totally, you're totally you find that, I find that in my business too yeah no and it's and it's I think it's it's it can be obviously it applies literally here and and I'm with you. Like I, uh, I think some people think that I'm anti Etsy. Yeah. And I, my thing is, I just don't want businesses um, relying on it completely. Yeah. Um, but if it's making you money, I am by no means telling you to like turn it off. Yeah. And but but even broader than that, I think you're totally right. Like I find even if I focus too much of my marketing and like one 
social marketing, like social media platform. Right. You know, I said I'm like missing potential opportunity to like develop an audience elsewhere. Yeah. So that's really true. And I think it's, you have to be comfortable to some degree of being okay with not being focused on one mm-hmm. thing at a time. Yeah. It's a hard thing to do. It's really hard. <laughs> it's okay. really hard. So we've got uh, a couple of minutes left. Um, can you please tell us the story behind how you got featured in Oprah Magazine? Yes. Okay, yes. awesome. Um, so I was, this was many moons ago, um, with a company I was running called Liga Masiva, which was like a global farmer's market. So we were working with organic farmers in Latin America, and then people would sign up for a subscription to their products um, so here cool. in the U.S. It was really neat. Um, but definitely shows the common thread of my passion of helping creative people get their work to market and do it in a sustainable way. Cause same thing. Um, but we were, so we were doing that. And I, I mean, I literally just got an email one day from a writer that was like, I'm doing a piece for Oprah and I would like to write about you. Wow. So that's a great email to get. Yeah. Um, we set a call. I was very well prepared for Good. what to say on the call for the interview. I, it was also the springtime and I had an unstoppable allergic reaction. So I was sneezing and coughing incessantly during the call. It was so embarrassing. Oh my gosh. I was totally fine. That passed. I I'm was sure like, that was much a bigger deal for you than it was for me. Yeah, I know. She was probably, I know she probably didn't even notice. Anyway, so the article came out, but I always think it's so funny because it was like a huge boost in terms yeah. of sales and stuff, but mm-hmm. You know, people, I always think, like, I could, I, I did calculate, like, well, wait a minute, how big of a boost is this going to be? Because I had gotten advice from someone else that had been in Oprah that usually what people do is they actually over-prepare. They'll build up too much inventory or they'll put too many systems in place or they'll start, like, hiring people because they think they're going to get this big bump. And this doesn't just apply to Oprah. I think this applies to other press or other like big bumps that people might be expecting. Like if somebody's featured on Buzzfeed or something like that. And I, so I sat down and I was like, well, how much could this really be? So then I was like, okay, they have, I think it was like 40 million subscribers. So of the 40 million, how many people open it this month? All right. Let's assume it's like three quarters. Of, the th- of those three quarters, how many people are going to read this page of the magazine? And I was like, well, I don't know, maybe a quarter of those? or yeah. So I, what I did was I, like, calculated down, like, down to the people that I would actually visit my website. Of those, how many people would actually purchase something? And I was like, oh, it is going to be a bump, but it's not going to be, like, this crazy bump. So you realize that you're, like, a rare animal when it comes to like being this creative space right i don't i don't i don't think that way that's a little insane right <laughs> that's yeah. awesome though and obviously it's helpful. it's helpful it's a helpful thing and i think that we should all like it's it's something i've used in other situations now yeah. and um yeah i usually give people the advice like press can be good but it's not the magic be all end all oh yeah no i i'm i'm all with you because i think that there's especially with kind of the facebook focused businesses out there i think there's a people focus a lot on views that they get on something or right. likes and um, those metrics may or may not matter, or at least you have to kind of filter that down into right. something that is helpful. And then another thing that I'm seeing is businesses have very direct, especially if they're starting their big goals in their business are like sales driven goals. Yeah. And then if you, if you don't build out, good systems of what happens when those sales come in, Yeah, then you might be making money, but you're uh, pulling your might, hair out all day. Right, or you might be bringing money in the door, but you might not be making money. Right. Right, right. or like Kickstarter yeah. is a big thing that, you know, relates to this. Oh my gosh, I, you know, I got $50,000 on Kickstarter, but it was a giant fiasco and it cost me 55000 right, or whatever. Yep. Yeah, well, and... The I really like what you said about like you you mostly work with people who have uh, are beyond the idea stage. Um, so I'm from St. Louis, and uh, before I started working with startups, uh, or before I started working with the the creative side of business owners, I was working more with like tech startups. Mm. And it was really interesting to have that experience as a startup lawyer in St. Louis mm-hmm. because 
I talk to a couple people who uh, give money to startups on a pretty like large basis or, or uh, investors in the area. And they were like, you know, the Midwest is a really weird space to, to do this because there are a lot of people I've learned that people will be more are more likely to give your business money yeah. at that idea stage than they are to actually pay for the product. Mm -hmm. and there's this like niceness of, oh, sure, I'll like donate to your cause or loan you money or whatever to like be a good person. Um, but that's that might not be helpful your, for your business at all. Right. If it ends up being the case that you then have the thing and you create it and those people who funded you aren't even interested in buying from you. The, yes, yes. A absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people want to go to an expert to ask the expert whether their product is good, whether their price is good, whether there's a market for their products. Like people ask me all the time and um, it's hard. I don't think there's any predicting it. Yeah. I, I would probably benefit from acting like I'm the person that can predict it after having helped all these people grow wholesale. Yeah. I don't think I don't think there's a way to do it. It really depends, and it depends on the execution of it. And so the only way to know is by putting yourself out there and getting that feedback and seeing what works. Yeah, and then refining from there. So well, and, and wholesale is a I think that's such a great direction of having that tested in that way. Yeah. Because you you really are saying okay like if if I can convince the store to put this on their shelves, are will people buy? Right. Yeah, and store owners are pretty great about um, being pretty direct about feedback, and um, if you ask for it, letting you know like why it might not have been a good fit, and that's really valuable information. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. really great that they're that they're nice like that. Okay. Yeah. So Emily, we're, we're going to hop off in just a little bit here. Um, and it's wholesaleinabox.com. Yep. The business website, right? Yeah. Is there any particular page that you would want to direct people to if they're starting or wanting to learn more? Or would you suggest that they just go right to, to the homepage? Go to the homepage, but there are a lot of free resources on there. There's a, um, you can click, there's a training center that has really in-depth guides around wholesale. Um, we also have a free um, challenge coming up in May, and the signups are actually open for it right now. So it's wholesaleinabox.com slash five tiny steps challenge. Kate, maybe Caitlin can put that up. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's it's going to be super fun. We're going to have giveaways. Um, it's completely it's just kind of great response so far. So it's going to be a bunch of makers supporting each other to take some tiny steps to grow wholesale. So that could be a good place to start. Awesome. That's, that's really, really cool. Emily, thank you so yeah. much for your time. This, I know I had a blast. Um, so what, what I'm going to do is, is we're going to close up here. Uh, okay. If anybody has any questions uh, for Emily, yeah. um, Emily, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a couple other posts that I'll share that are linking to this video. Um, so for the next couple of days or so, um, Emily and I will kind of be manning the, the comments in this video. If yeah. you guys have any questions or, uh, you know, comments as, as you watch, be sure to let us know and we'll do what we can to respond. Definitely. Uh, have a great week, everybody. That's it. Thanks, Joey. Bye.